Hi everybody, um, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's York Festival of Ideas of End in combination with the writers um, at York, hosted by the Department of English and Related Literature here at the University. Um, so tonight's event is a conversation with the um, Singaporean novelist Charlene Theram. So before I introduce Charlene, I wanted to run through a few technical notes which um, is uh, now appearing in the chat as well. Um, if you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button um, down the bottom of your screen. Uh, this is available throughout the event, so you can ask questions as soon as you like, um, so that they're ready for us to dive into um, when we come to audience questions. Subtitles are also available in this event. Um, so if you're seeing them now, you are able to turn them off using the CC Live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. If you can't see them, that's where you turn them on as well. If you have any technical issues, um, such as the loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using uh, the original link. Um, and please also remember that today's conversation is going to be, well, is currently being recorded, uh, so you'll be able to watch it again. Um, and rewatch and rewatch and rewatch if you if you uh, are so inclined. So hailing from Singapore and now based in the UK, Charlene Teo is one of the most daring and innovative contemporary um, novelists to debut in the last few years. Charlene has a PhD in creative and critical writing and an MA in creative writing from the University of East Anglia, where she received the Booker Prize Foundation Scholarship and the David T. K. Wong Creative Writing Award. She holds fellowships from the Elizabeth Costova Foundation and the University of Iowa International Writing Program. And she is a lecturer in creative writing at the University of Kent. Her debut novel, Ponty, published in 2018, won the Deborah Rogers Writers Award even before publication. And um, about this novel, Ian McEwan wrote, uh, it was remarkable raising the way her characters glow with life and humor and minutely observed uh, minutely observed desperation. The novel, if you haven't read it, uh, follows three women's interrelated lives across, um, um, across 50 years in Singapore, stretching from the faded past of um, Southeast Asian B-grade horror um, movies to a shining metropolis of the near future of 2020. There's Sue, a teenage girl who finds it difficult to fit in at school. Her mother, Amisa, who was a B-grade horror actress in her youth and Circe, Sue's one-time best friend. So here to talk to us uh, about her first novel, practices of writing and reading, uh, perhaps a little of what it's like to be a writer this past year, um, if we can not escape the pandemic um, and much, much more is Charlene. Thank you so much for being here for this conversation this evening. Uh, for it is a conversation that is a, has been a long time coming. Uh, we first planned this conversation for the festival last year before real, um, yeah, the world of real life events became untenable. 
and uh, a few months before that um, uh, was to take place, we exchanged some messages over Instagram while I was in Singapore um, on a sofa back uh, to the UK after Christmas uh, in New Zealand. I dug these out because I wanted to remember what you said to me. Um, you instructed me to have some prawn noodles for you, which I did. Um, and over the next couple of days, I saw a Singapore in part directed entirely by your eye. Um, and you even gave me some advice to stop thinking about work, which I <laughs> greatly, greatly appreciate. <laughs> um, so I've been thinking about this for the past few days, not just because my time in Singapore was the last time I wasn't on these shores before the pandemic, but also because we're now finally having this conversation um, and I've been rereading Ponte. Um, and through this process, I've realized how much of my experience of the city was so shaped by you. So I wondered if we could start there. Um, your writing is very much located in place. Even houses are evoked with personality. Is this interest in where your characters live uh, and contextualizing their lives within their surroundings, um, does this have to do with ideas of authenticity and self-definition, problems with both of those concepts uh, because they are so problematic? Where does it come from, this interest? In, in place? Yeah. Um, firstly, thanks so much for having me, Alexandra. I really, really um, appreciate it. And it's so nice to, to meet you in, in this, this strange but um, inevitable context. Um, I really like that this is called the Festival of Ideas. So I do hope that in the next hour or so we, we, we get to exchange ideas. And, and I'd love to hear um, more about your ideas as well and, and what you're working on. Because um, I understand you, 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 you focus a lot on the contemporary, right? And, and the contemporary and the possibilities of the form. And that's something that I'm, I'm really interested in as well. Um, so to your question, I think um, setting, oftentimes I think it's used in, in the kind of um, marketing of writers and, and debut novelists especially mm -hmm. as a kind of selling point. And it's just one of those inevitable things that comes with the sort of packaging and the kind of, um, you know, the kind of summary of a novel. And I think with, with Ponty in particular, um, which I have, I have it right here, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's so much, so much, um, of the novel is about Singapore. You know, Singapore is, is a character in it. Um, and they, they always say with your debut novel, it, it's, it comes from the compost heap of your imagination. Like it, it comes from the surviving childhood and, and all that kind of um, collection or aggregation of memories and impressions um, that we've, we've been storing up our whole lives. Um, so to me, Singapore is, is, you know, it could only have been set in Singapore really. Um, it's a deeply, deeply Singaporean novel, but um, I would I would add the caveat that it's Singapore as I knew it. So I haven't lived there full time since 2005, 2006. So it's very much located in, in that kind of specificity of place and time. Yeah. Yeah. How does it feel to be an expat at this at this moment in time? That's a that's a good question. I, I think in, in a sense, we are all um, we've all suddenly become expats. We've become unmoored. So we are we are we are tourists in our neighborhoods. Um, you know, people people have been forced. I mean, it's it's almost a cliche by this point. One year one year and a half into the pandemic, um, to kind of reflect in these unprecedented times, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, a lot of people have have expressed a lot more of a keen interest in gardening and bird song and things like that. At least in the in the UK. Um, but in terms of navigating my own my own foreignness and my own kind of migrant identity. I, I would say, frankly, that that the past year has only um, kind of um, accentuated <laughs> aloneness <laughs> and this and this feeling of being neither here nor there. Um, and I think that that's useful for, for creativity to a point, but um, I think there is a limit. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you mean. I mean, it's... <laughs> I remember saying to my colleagues at the beginning, like right at the very beginning of the pandemic, that the thing that I was most terrified of was never being able to get home. And, and that was coming at the moment at which the flights um, like started being cancelled. Uh, New Zealand closed its borders um, yeah. for the first time in history. And, and <laughs> it started to get to this point where like, I, I'm stuck here. I'm actually stuck here. If I wanted to go home, I couldn't. Um, and it's a long trip, you know, it's, it's really it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's really <laughs> long. <laughs> so the, just this idea, like, yeah, completely, completely unmoored. And, and it can be, 
it can be an incredibly debilitating idea as well, being so far away from from our home. And and it's a home that I haven't lived for ten years. You know, I haven't I haven't lived there yet for a really long time now. So again, it is that kind of it's a place that yeah for me it's very nostalgic right it's 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 certainly not the same place that I left um so I mean I was wondering I mean obviously throughout this past year with with the pandemic there's been a lot of uh reports of racism um yeah. you know with Black Lives Matter you know how I mean have you felt politicized as a Southeast Asian writer throughout this year or even even previously in ways that I, I definitely do think, um, yeah, with like the whole stop Asian hate thing, and um, obviously there's been a lot. There's like been a three hundred percent rise in hate crimes against um, East Asian people in the UK alone. So it has kind of changed the sort of timber of, of daily interactions. I would say not not necessarily in the immediate surroundings, but it mm -hmm. it sort of emphasized um, to me and to, to various other kind of East Asian friends as well that. Um, I don't know. It's it, it's it's sort of heightened the sense of urgency, um, and I think that that it sort of reinforced um, ideas I already had that it is it is important to kind of um, you know be be proud of one's identity and to kind of explore that and to hopefully um, you know do work that in some way helps to develop understanding or you know helps helps people that might not other, otherwise you know occur to them to kind of see things in a, in a new way or you know which is which is a particular way uh, to to my my lived experience um so yeah definitely mm -hmm. have you read Kathy Park Hong's Minor Feelings yeah yeah I love that I love that I love that book um, I think it's absolutely fantastic um and mm -hmm. I've read another one recently by um Matthew Sol Solisas called mm -hmm. Craft in the Real World uh, which has been pretty mind blowing. Have you have you have you read that one? No, I haven't. I haven't come across it. But I always have all my books. I have piles of books right here. Let me show you. <laughs> Whatever. So this one is uh, this text right here, and it's um, he talks about um, at least twenty different ways in which you can um, sort of rethink the workshop model because he's saying that the the, the at least in the creative writing workshop space in particular there are like um particular rules and conventions which which are all really kind of they've been passed down and regurgitated originating in the ios school um but but he's 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 saying why why is that this way why is there the kind of emphasis given to you know the author stays silent and that there are particular kind of constructive questions which are raised but actually um, what matthew Salis is arguing is that this sometimes decenters the author and decenters more, more, more crucially, the kind of author's intention. So, like, um, he he suggests framing the workshop more as question. So, like, mm -hmm. the, the, everyone in the group only asks questions rather than unhelpful comments. I don't know if you've if you've had this with your own kind of seminar groups where people sometimes offer quite unhelpful comments where they're like, "This is great, I loved it." You know, kind of like, "Okay, there's nothing you can." You can't really go anywhere with that. You can't. You can't really go anywhere with this sucks, right? I'm, <laughs> um, yeah. So it was just like a, a kind of different sort of critical lens of of examining how we um, sort of navigate and and um, teach creative writing in the classroom because I think it is still very much a developing field. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, asking questions it's a very it's a very hard genre right um like the question um i found this year certainly so we've had the the um the new initiative of lecture q a's which didn't previously exist um it, and and so the idea that um students would after listening to your lecture would come and ask you uh questions in about it's like a half hour session um and it struck me that so many students don't actually know how to ask questions or don't know how to find the things that they're really interested in enough to actually frame a question around it as, as well. And, and it is like you do find that people rely on the comment or the critique or the bland, you know, um, oh, lovely, or, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's so empty of anything actually probative that, um, it's it's really rather useless. Um, so I think that 
I really like that idea that it's 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 helpful for the students who who aren't presenting one at a time, right? Because it, it, it gets them to start thinking through a different kind of form, that being the question. Um, but it's more helpful for the writer, I would imagine, because it means that you're you're being asked to really probe into the work, right? And and to account for it um, in hopefully a less intense way than if you were to receive just a barrage of comments. Yeah, hopefully. Um, and I guess for the past the past. Um, few months I've I've kind of been um, the one like I've been hosting the kind of well for, for one time like we take turns with it in, in Kent like I've been I did it for one time where I was asking the questions and I really like I find it really hard <laughs> it's actually that's why I didn't realize until I was in that position it's actually way harder to come up to be in your position right now it's it's pretty easy to answer questions actually like you know, not not you know relatively compared to, to 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 the, the 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 person like you know hosting chairing it's really tough and in the first few events that I did I was incredibly awkward I I, just, I would kind of go off on one and then I would forget those a few questions and then I would get really nervous and then just ask like really weird Borat style questions so I, really, I really admire like you you know you're kind of eased with it oh thank you well it's, it comes from feeling very anxious about it so I've got like about five pages worth of pre prepared questions in the event that I need that. Um, but I mean, I was I was thinking about that. I mean, in my work, I I'm I'm really interested in authorial intention. Um, um, I I remember as a I was going to say as a young academic, I'm, I'm still young, hopefully. But I'm I'm now five years into my career. I feel less of an early career researcher than I than I did a couple of years ago. I was so. I was so against this this kind of new criticism, you know, like uh, the, the text is the only thing that we must look at. I mean, I love I love the text. I love close reading. Um, that is my preferred kind of method of analysis. Um, but the idea that the author is dead, the author, you know, being replaced by the reader, obviously that opens up, you know. Uh, a whole range of different modes of interpretation and um, and modes of reading, which I'm also interested in, in as well. But the idea that the the author has been completely supplanted by the reader is is a really problematic idea, um, at least from kind of my critical uh, perspective. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was kind of wondering how. <laughs> how you feel about your own authorship, I suppose, if that makes sense as a question. Yeah, no, that's a re really great question. That's like a deep one, <laughs> um, really like not generic. Um, and I, I guess g generic also in the term of like genre, mm -hmm. the idea of like the genre of the author and, and how like um, some authors are more self-effacing and others um, kind of rise to the occasion. And it, mm -hmm. and it kind of, their personhood you know, sort of, I don't want to say infects the text, but kind of seeps into it and and and, and it kind of dominates as, as a kind of a kind of question, a kind of meta meta textual, metaphysical question. I'm thinking of one of my favorite writers here, Elena Ferrante. You know, Ferrante is the text. Ferrante, who is Ferrante? You know, um Ferrante, Elena in the text, um, in those those incredible novels. Um, you know, I think there's there's really nothing else quite like it. Um, so, so, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm nowhere near Ferrante, but I just, I just, um, when you asked me about, you know, authorship and stuff like that, I think personally, my, my novel Quanti came out in 2018. Uh, my first child, I love it dearly. I have it here, there's a battered copy. I'm very happy to read a short bit from it whenever you want. I, I, I was, I was a bit surly about it. I'm not surly, but I was like, oh, I don't want to read from it to you over email, but whatever, I, I'll do whatever you want. Um, it, you know, I love, I love this debut novel, but it, it, it came out in 2018. It feels especially with the pandemic a long time ago. So I don't think that anyone is exactly like waiting with basic breath. So I, I do feel like um, now that I'm done with promoting it, that kind of immediate like um, thing when I was a lot more on social media, I actually feel quite free. I, I feel like no, one really, no one's really like, you know, looking out for it. No one's really watching me. I can do whatever. Um, so I, I, I last year I finished the, the draft of my second novel. Um, and, and uh, very optimistically, I was hoping that, you know, by the time that we had this conversation, which felt very far in the future, I'd be done with it. But I'm, I'm, I'm kind of still in the middle of rewriting it. Um, you know, so it's, I think um, I do I do think a little bit more, I guess, now that I've had one book out about particular elements of that sort of um, more public facing reception. 
I, I do think like, oh, you know, people that didn't like particular things about the first novel, oh, they're not even gonna, they're gonna double hate <laughs> things about the second one, you know? And it's, it's, it's a question of, I think like taking on board um, constructive critiques from people that I trust, readers that I trust, and also, you know, elements of my own writing that I know are, you know, weak or whatever, and trying to work on that. And, and on the other hand, kind of doubling down on what I believe in, even though that, that might seem contradictory to what is gonna sell or what is going to be, you know, generating interest or whatever. So yes, I think it's that, that balance. Mm. No, I really, I really admire the commitment to the things that you find really important in your own writing. I, I, I have this, I have this horror of like, <laughs> of the market and of, you know, what makes a text commercial because those are ultimately things that as a critic, I find least interesting. I mean, I think the kind of the, um, the construction um, of the literary marketplace, the history of the literary marketplace, especially in the US, which is where a lot of my research is kind of focused, is, is fascinating, it's absolutely fascinating. But the idea that a text can be shaped by what is commercial is, is also horrifying to me as a, as a complete aesthete. Like I, I really appreciate form for form's sake and you know, the artfulness of, of yeah novels in particular um so yeah i mean could you speak a little bit more about how how, how you do balance those um, uh, i suppose expectations versus your intentions like i said i don't i don't think there are really any expectations on me i'm, not, I'm literally like you know like i'm not I'm, I'm like you know even even like people that are well known in the literary industry like in terms of like numbers you know we're not we're not like olivia rodrigo you know what i mean <laughs> like, you know, you're not, you're not like, you know, there's not like millions of people, like no one cares. And I think that's like so incredibly freeing. Like, I, I think I had this conversation with, with um, another writer a few years ago, and we were saying, actually, like, there's no point kind of stressing ourselves out and quibbling because we, we exist in a world where, you know, sometimes you can get so rarefied in this bubble where you assume everyone knows who even someone as famous as Margaret Atwood is. But the, the truth of the matter is not really. And like, even if, like, I, I don't know, I just don't, I don't really feel like, expectations come anywhere into the, the sort of drafting of, of the work right now I guess when I'm done with it and if I sell it again then I would have my own expectations or like hopes you know I'd be like oh you know I hope that this, you know, put food on my table in some way um, but besides that I, I don't really think it's helpful um, or, or particularly creatively conducive to to think of that while you're working yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can see how it could be completely limiting. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's something that as a critic, you kind of have to think about a little bit, but also, you know, that scholarship is scholarship. And, you know, even if you only have three readers, you you still get three readers <laughs> and, yeah. and that that's kind of worthwhile in and of itself. Or, or the work itself is, 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 you know, something of value, even if nobody reads it. Um, but that's a kind of a luxury of academic publishing, I think, when, you know, there's no, there's no kind of expectation of, yeah, I don't, I don't know, being paid from from the work. <laughs> like, it's yeah, just kind of like that. <laughs> there's a question that's just come up. Should we, should we deal with that? Should we talk about that? Oh, yes. So, okay. Um, how central is Singapore to your writing? Will your future works be set there? Um, well, I would say like Singapore, as, as I said, is absolutely central to the first novel. Um, but I think that I would say rather than Singapore itself as it is being central to my writing, mm -hmm. uh, I think I can only foresee myself writing Singaporean characters. So like um, I, in the novel that I'm working on now, um, a, a part of it is set in Singapore. So it kind of, it's set in different countries, but you know, I, I would say the kind of emotional center of it is set in Singapore. And, mm -hmm. and the next one that I have planned is also set in Singapore. <laughs> um, but the one after that, that I have kind of planned roughly is not really set anywhere. Um, but I've, I've tried I've tried writing things that are set nowhere and it hasn't really worked, so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's another question. Of all the creative writing courses you took, what was the most useful? And useful is in um, inverted commas. Ooh, um, ooh okay. Uh, I've only taken well. I only did. I did. I did the MA at UVA. Um, so I guess, I guess that one. <laughs> it was. It was really. It was very really useful in the sense. Not. Not in the sense that I. I um, immediately thought that it would be, and that I didn't immediately come out there with like a best-selling, 
book under my arm. If anything, I spent that whole year, I was quite young, I was in my early 20s or something, I, I spent the whole year like, you know, getting really drunk and hungover and having these shame overs. And then like talking with my fellow writers in the, in the, in the campus bar about our amazing novels and then just like talking the ideas out and not actually writing it. <laughs> but, but that year was incredibly useful in terms of it being a humbling experience and also like um, realizing that, um, you know, to write something substantial, substantive, it, you know, it requires sort of turning up and, and sitting with yourself and your hangover shame or, or your lack of ideas or whatever, every single, like, you know, as regularly as possible, you know, with, with some rigor and some discipline. And that's not something that I realized beforehand where I'd worked for two years in an office um, and, and kind of dreamt of, of the kind of writer's life as being one in which, you know, you know, you rise at the crack of dawn and then you write, you know, bathed in golden light with a quill or whatever. And then, you know, you pluck off and, like, you know, have like a Hemingway martini. <laughs> you know, there's a certain amount of like glamour and allure. And I think that mm. that that's quite that's quite a, a, a kind of common thing. And that, that there's this kind of mystique around around the creative process of writers in particular. There's there's a mystification of it because it's baffling that that unlike artists or unlike musicians, you know, anyone with anyone that's literate technically can write. So therefore, there is a kind of seeming alchemy from the outside of what kind of what kind of habits and magical processes, you know, there's that real endless fascination with with a writer's kind of daily daily life. And I think paired with that is a to me, I think a cultural perception that that anyone can write if you give them the time. So if you give them the time and you give them the right formula of how to behave, then they'll do it. So I think what I, what I learned in that year in the MA is that there's no magic formula. What works for one person does not work for the other. You don't have to write 5,000 words a day or 500 or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. it's really just like doing what suits you. But the thing that I always tell my students, my MA students who are like, you know, working on novels, the thing they absolutely, absolutely have to do, and, and I would tell this to anyone who, like me in a party, who's like, oh, I want to write a novel, is you absolutely have to remain engaged with, with books. And it's, it's so baffling to me how few people actually realize. They just, they're just like, oh, I don't, I don't actually have the time to read, but I have this great idea for this story. And it's like, I'm sorry, like, if you're not a reader, you cannot bloody write. You have no business writing. It's like saying, like, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I want to be a chef, but I hate food. <laughs> you know, or I want to be a swimmer, but I, I, you know, I can't, I hate water, you know, I hate, I hate getting my skin wet. <laughs> you know, I think, I think you don't need to necessarily lay down a thousand words every day or like, you know, be like Murakami and run an ultra marathon to clear your head. But, but I think what, what one needs to do and what I learned from that year, um, the creative writing I made was it's really, really necessary to, to, to be able to read as a writer and read critically and remain open to ideas and the kind of possibilities of what, what we can do. And I, I think the novel is really not dead. I think the contemporary novel is mm -hmm. alive and kicking. I think it's in rude health. And mm -hmm. it's entering this, this phase now with, of, you know, the internet novel, <laughs> you know, and, and all that is, um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, definitely not dead. Um, have, you, have you read, um, the Lockwood novel, the Patricia Lockwood novel. I have it right here. It's like my, my endless pile of books that are, that is near me. I have that one right here. I don't know. I just know why I feel very like like I want to show you things. <laughs> it's a show and tell element. <laughs> <laughs> Got it right here. Um, no, I I. I, I, I have this, this thing where if I go into an in, independent bookshop, I have to buy something because I just feel like mm -hmm. I, need, I want to support the industry. So I, I, I got this from a beautiful um, bookshop by the Thames and uh, I, I've had a read of the first six pages. Have you, have you read it? I've, I've only read about half. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I really liked what I read. It reminds me a bit of Jenny Offal. Yes, I, I found the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and I think the overlaps only get stronger as, as the novel goes on. Um, but I'm enjoying it though. Um, I only just started it on the weekend. Um, we've got a question um, about your current work, but I wondered whether we might just save that one for the end. Okay. Um, and in the meantime, I mean, given you were just talking about reading, what, what have you been reading? What has been really comforting or consoling or frustrating or enthralling um, in terms of what you've read over the last, last um. year? Yeah, I love that question. I love, I love, so, so um, I, 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 I'm an absolutely obsessive reader. I love reading, but the, the thing is, I'm actually very slow. 
Uh, and I'm also like one of those people that reads various things at once, which I think is like a bit like cheating. So like um, of the of recent recently the things I read, I absolutely love this Italian novel called A Girl Returned by Donatella Di Pietri, which is very very Ferrante esque and very um, atmospheric and very aff affecting and aff affectively kind of charged. Um, beautiful, I love that. Um, I, I'm reading Jazz by Toni Morrison right now, which is just on a sentence level, incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also reading, I'm also reading, um, well, this is more for work. I'm reading a book to, to review called Build Your House Around My Body, which I love. It's by Violet Cooper Smith. It's, it's very, very much like in, the, in the kind of whole um, Gothic, like modern Gothic vein, but it's set in Vietnam. And it's, it's just full of kind of dark, imaginative wildness. Um, so I'm really enjoying that. And I'm also reading um, a, a poetry collection by Chen Chen called When I Grow Up, I Want to Be a List of Future possi Further Possibilities. So those are the things I'm, I'm reading right now. What, what about you? What, what have you loved recently? I've, um, I've been rereading a few things um, because I've got a, a list of deadlines that I've been quite slow to, <laughs> to so I've been rereading. So um, I've been rereading some Natalia Ginsberg, um, which I only discovered, I think, in last, last summer. So she's, she's my kind of reading for pleasure at the moment. Um, I've been reading Christine Smallwood's um, The Life of the Mind, um, which is a little bit too close for comfort. It's about um, a, an academic at the beginning of her career and how she feels about all of that. Um, I'm also reading, here we go, I can um, do my chantel. Um, I'm reading <laughs> Holiday Heart by Margarita Garcia Robayo, which is just phenomenal. I'm writing a chapter on, on it. So Holiday Heart is a is a medical condition that one of the main characters is suffering from and it's a it's kind of medical condition that uh, comes about uh, from eating too luxuriously generally on holidays so it's not a congenital heart disease it's something that's acquired but um, when I first picked up the novel I, I, I thought it was referring to the kind of feeling that you had towards the end of a holiday oh, yeah. you know, like sadness and so I was kind of quite I was sad when I realized it was actually a medical condition, but I think that the novel is is kind of working through the affective conditions of holiday heart as that's well. So that's what my argument is going to be. Um, did, she write yeah. fish soup? did she write fish soup? She did. Yes. Okay. Oh, I read a bit of that. That's like amazing. It's kind of like Lolita, but something like that. Something disturbing and quite yeah. violent. And yeah, she's great. Yeah, yeah. I, I love her. I, I, I love her style. I mean, obviously this is in translation, but I think the translation is just epic. Um, but it's it's so terse and cruel. And I, oh, I love yeah. the fiction that is terse and cruel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like 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 um like a sentence, like a fist in the mouth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um I think you know who else writes a bit like that? Um, um I think Julie, have you read Julianne Pacheco? No, I haven't. She's, she's got this incredible new novel out called The Ant Hill. So speaking of MAs, Julianne, Julianne and I did um, MA in the same year together at UVA and, and even back then she was incredible. She had like a really, really fully formed vision um, of the world. So she's got a, she's had a collection come out called The Lucky Ones and, and then The Ant Hill is, is her, her debut novel and, and that's really, really like violent, violent, um, yeah. <laughs> Cool, cool. I will, I will write that down. I'm always looking for really excellent uh, recommendations. Um, so I wonder whether you might want to read a little bit from Ponty now. Yeah, sure, sure. sure. Um, any bit, okay. Yeah, any bit, any bit. So thank you for introducing it. So I don't have to explain it again. <laughs> um, okay, so this is this is um. Let me think. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I haven't, I haven't actually read from it in a long time. So <laughs> maybe, okay, maybe just like the beginning bit. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good part of the novel. So okay. <laughs> All right, this is from the right, right, very beginning. Sue, <laughs> so, 2003. I'll just read for a few minutes, not very long. 
Um, today marks my 16th year on this hot, horrible earth. I am stuck in school, standing with my palms pressed against a green wall. I am pressing so hard that my fingers ache. I am tethered to this wall by my own shame. I am in trouble again. I keep finding myself in trouble. It takes me weeks to wade out of it. There is something dishonest about my face, even when I'm telling the truth. What can you do when you're born with a bad face? I think that's why most people don't take to me. Yes, take to me. The way that ducks take to water or kids take to certain talents. The way the other girls in school seem to be best friends in seconds, in jokes and easy laughter. When I was 11, I used to hope that puberty would morph me, that one day I'd uncurl from my chrysalis, bloom out beautiful. No luck, acne instead, disgusting hair, blood. I take off to my father's side, apparently, the homely ashen ums, a family of grifters and gamblers, smugglers and runaways. People are superficial, whether they admit it or not. I wouldn't be stuck here if I looked even a tiny bit more like my mother, who is a monster but so stunning that she can get away with anything. Even when she's not around, I can feel her eyes on my back, the pinprick glare of her disapproval. True horror fans know her as Amisa Tan, screen name Amisa Tan Xiaofang. Day to day, she is the kind of woman who never sweats, who wouldn't be caught dead talking with a mouthful of food. She eats like a bird, smokes like a chimney. Back when she left the house, more often she used to get fruit and flowers offered to her, like some sort of pagan goddess at the wet market, by stuttering men of all ages, who also competed to help her with her bags. She accepted the free gifts but declined the manpower, made me carry all the shopping instead. All the way home, cars slowed in stately reverence as my mother sauntered down the roadside, me trailing behind her. Strained plastic candles cut into my palms, the weight of future dinners aches my shoulders and forearms. Thank you. I will just do a, um, a uh, <laughs> virtual round of applause. Virtual but silent round of applause. Um, I love the opening of the novel. I really, I really do. Um, a couple of years ago, um, I was invited to read read a scene um, from a, a text that reminded me of Christmas um, at a a Christmas Waterstones event and and my colleagues or you know read something from Little Women or something from Charles Dickens and I read I read the opening part of your novel <laughs> <laughs> because Christmas is so hot in New Zealand I was just like it's the stickiness that makes me feel like Christmas and I was speaking to this room of um of people who probably just had no idea what I was going on about <laughs> Um, but I wondered if we could talk a little bit about film. Um, so, I mean, obviously the novel is, it like engages with film a lot um, through, its, through its plot, through its characters. Um, but I also, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, such a, it's such a cliche to say that something feels filmic, but there was a filmic kind of tonality to Ponte. And I wondered, yeah, whether it was on purpose, if, of writing with kind of film or having film so kind of clearly as another form that you're engaging with while writing a novel that was that was a conscious part oh, of totally that it was totally conscious i i love i love mm -hmm. film i'm actually like one 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 of the like only accomplishments i've, I've <laughs> achieved over the, the past crazy years I, I i wrote a kind of small script for the first time and i made a short film over lockdown oh. um, which is like um acted by salvanian animals <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was that was like a, it was really exciting for me to, to, to do that. But I've, I've never actually really written a script before, and I don't really have any. I mean, I, I believe in like sticking to my lane and trying to be good at like just one thing at a time. Um, but but I, I I am deeply informed by film. I love film. Um, so obviously, I think the Ponty Ponty um, is very much influenced by you know actual kind of Singaporean Malaysian kind of B horror movies that were made mainly in the fifties and sixties. And also like the, the kind of giallo films from, from the, the um, Italian masters in the 70s. Um, and and um, also um, contemporary sort of horror, liminal horror. So, so, you know, newer things like It Follows or like The Love Witch, that whole kind of aesthetic of, of film, the grammar of film, I, I really love. And I, I get a lot of inspiration from, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it was the filmmaker, was it Trin? 
T. Minha, who said that um, in filmmaking, you can kind of speak nearby to a group of people instead of about necessarily. And there was a, especially as I was rereading Ponte, um, I was thinking about that, that there's, there's an element of um, nearbyness, if that makes sense, in, in the way in which you're kind of directing the lens of the novel towards these three women um, across across the novel and across their their lives. Um, yeah, um, I was wondering too about um, sort of on, on on this kind of question of film and I suppose visual culture more broadly. Right, there's a lot of kind of attention to women's looks throughout the novel. Right, this this kind of question of being a spectacle, being a visual spectacle as 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 a woman, um, and and the way in which identity is often kind of formed around those kinds of you know potentially quite kind of superficial kind of concerns or questions, and I and I wonder whether you might want to talk a little bit of, a bit more about about that and that as a concern in the novel. Yeah, I think that definitely plays a, a large part of of um, what I was trying to explore and convey, the idea of um, beauty, like beauty as a trope um, mm -hmm. in fiction and in stories, and also the, the idea of the superficiality of beauty and, and the spectacle of the face. So like, you know, um, a kind of cinematic artifact as, as also an artifact of beauty, form mm -hmm. of beauty, and, and like the, the idea that um, on, on, the other, on the other side of beauty is, you know, be beauty stands for youth, stands for exuberance, right? And that's what culture and media and advertising will, will have us know. And on the other side of that is really the fear of death and decay, mm. and deterioration. So I've always found it, you know, quite fascinating. Like, you know, if you if you if you watch, I think like, you know, really, really one of the most popular franchises in the world, if you look at the Star Wars films, for example, mm. and you know, you see how young, for example, Harrison Ford is, and, and you know, naturally people age. And it's it's I think Hollywood actors in particular are the number one. Um, in a sense, like um, reminder to, to us that everyone gets old. <laughs> you know, you can have millions and millions of dollars, pounds, whatever, and it, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't stop that. And it's mm. it's that kind of confrontation of mortality that that kind of perpetuates our obsession with youth and youthfulness and, and youth culture. Um, and I think that that's something that that very much I hope comes through in the book, like the Misa Misa's kind of entire kind of cultural social capital lies in, in her beauty because she's kind of grown up in quite a kind of hostile environment um and and one of the only you know kind of the first moment or one of the only moments of kindness through her is by, by these these kind of people fleeing in the forest and and the woman says that she's a lovely girl and she's you know she's a pretty girl and that's the first time that she realizes that she has something to offer and then yeah. that kind of becomes something in her mind as, as you know one of her only points of definition Mm -hmm. um, which leads her to be quite uncaring and quite hostile to, to her own daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we just need to look at the um, Friends reunion, right, to realize <laughs> everybody really does age and <laughs> makes us really nostalgic for the first season of Friends when everybody looks so young. Um, um, I wondered, um, perhaps we come to the question about, about your current work. Um, sure. So are you able to tell us a little bit about your current work? Obviously, yeah. obviously I, it's still something in process, so. Um, I'm rewriting it now, but I, I think that um, I, I just, I was just half watching it, because you were talking about recordings of talks, actually, and I was half watching this this really long talk by Sheila Hesse. So I've, I've done a whole hour, so now into the second hour, but she talks in it about, about actually being more open with sharing things mm. in progress, because I think she said, I made a note of what she said, and it was very clever. She said along the lines of, you don't need to leave it till the end, like, you know, to have to have more opinion, like public opinions come in because like, you know, that mm. it might be helpful along the way. And I think that, that 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 kind of advice is really relative to who you're sharing it to and stuff like that. But um, she's basically saying like, you know, one's ideas should be more resilient. Like, you know, it's quite superstitious, this kind of secrecy around it. So, but that being said, I would be completely secretive if I hadn't finished it once before, if you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So it's, um, it's, I could, I mean, I could either, I could vaguely summarize it and then I could read you a little bit or I could just read you a little bit. Oh, how about vague? I, I would love to hear the vague summary of it. And then 
yeah, it's called it's called Take Care, and it's about um, it centers around a Singaporean family, um, and um, over it takes place over twenty years. Um, um, and what happens is at the beginning of the novel in 1998 is uh, the, the youngest kid there, like she's four years old, she goes missing. And it's about the kind of effect on her siblings and, and her parents um, over the next 20 years, particularly when, when they find her. So that's it summarized. Mm. I'm so glad that it's um, still called Take Care because I'd like to talk to you about, about that phrase and also about care. But before I ask you those questions, do you want to read us a little bit? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite I'm quite excited to. This feels like maybe I hope, I hope I'm not cursing it, but I mean I just, I'm just quite excited to because I've just never read it, read from it before. So here here it goes. It's just just I'll just read a short bit. I'm just reading it from the screen. I always I always told myself I'd never do that. It's kind of dickish behavior, but I'm sorry. I just haven't put it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, take care. Chapter one. Uh, Lee Young, 1998. For now, there were five of them. 28th May, 1998. In their own way. Every member of the Chan family would regret this day for as long as they lived. While standing in a queue or stuck in traffic, in the dead of the night, dry mouthed in bed, the fear and panic would rise up over and over with all the unreliable vividness that memory could muster. The Chans were holidaying in the old town of Lijiang. Over two years had passed since a devastating earthquake. Since then, the damage had been plastered over, prettied into a global attraction. It was a benevolently uncloudy Thursday. Jay Dragon Snow Mountain tipped highlighter orange, the best hour for photos. Old town all timber and bluestone and cluttered with tourists. Stuck in a dawdling procession, Roland Chan sighed and strolled with a heavy camera slung around his neck. Beside him, his wife's shoe fan dabbed at her brow, one hand resting absently on her stomach. 26 weeks along, she dreaded the soul splitting pain that teased its eventual arrival with a now distinct constant constipation. Their eldest son, Ivan, 12, trudged slightly behind. Kai, 9, kept pace with his parents, holding his little sister's hand. Gerda Chan was four years old and looked even younger. She had a heart-softening face framed by cropped hair like a boy's, shorn from a recent bout of head lice. Even though the melathion, I don't know how to say this word, melathion lotion had cured her, she still scratched herself out of idle habit missed the itchy and elusive bugs her oldest brother Ivan had told her fed her bad thoughts. Gerda scratched and scratched her head now, scrambling to take it all in. The strong smells and storybook, storybook roofs of this very new, very old place. Her first trip ever outside of Singapore, the first time she'd been on a plane. Flying made her ears hurt. This way she'd learned that a small ache was part of leaving home, holiday or not. Going overseas, over these seas, slate green and unending. The ocean was too big and deep, Ivan said, to keep swimming the length of it without running out of air. Now the Chans walked through this ancient town where people looked like them, but talk shouted in a marble-mouthed, slippery dialect even Roland and Shufen couldn't understand. Mr. and Mrs. Chan met in 1985, working at the same Singaporean accountancy firm that Roland was now a partner at, Hua Bun Huat and Co. Back then, Shufen was the most competent finance assistant with a gold prize butt and sexy legs, Roland, the slacking junior accountant with a round, fastidious face. What a soft man. I would like to poke him, Shufen thought, when she first saw Roland wandering toward the water cooler. One day he asked her to lunch. Lunches turned to dinners. Torrid fumbles in the dark. Skin contact led to heart contact, or at least a queasy twinging of. Anxious, anxious to make his dying father proud, Roland pr proposed to Shufen after only six months together, kneeling gingerly in the park near the office. She hesitated for a moment. Her heart was still blocked up and bruised by a feather hair Lothario, one Jeffrey Lum. This chump, Roland Chan, he was only okay. But he seemed to lack the imagination for elaborate disloyalty. He was on track for a promotion even though she was better at her job. She liked her various advantages over him. The tender proprietary way he cupped his hand on the small of her back as they entered a room. Get up, Lau, I'll marry you. She often simpered into Roland's haircut. He was 30 when they got engaged. She was 25, pallid and slight, with a jittery voice that belied the calm shrewdness in her eyes. That's it. Fantastic. I mean, I can't wait to read more. I, <laughs> it's a very striking, striking word name. Um, care, take care. Where did the title come from? Why, why take care? Why, why care? I think um, I had a few friends tell me it's a Drake song, <laughs> but I didn't get it. It's a Drake song. Um, 
I, I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a song by Beach House that I really like called Take Care, but I also really, really like the phrase. I, I find it incredibly melancholy and I, I've always found the concept of care and the ways in which we, we tell each other to take care of each other and, 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 and the connotations of, of caring and not caring um, really, really, really narratively um, existentially rich and interesting. Mm -hmm. And I feel that day to day when we, we, we use the phrase so much, it kind of is rendered meaningless it's like when people say I love you too much you know what I mean mm. it's one of those phrases that 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 it's it kind of meaning and intention gets kind of mm. rubbed out through, mm. through wear and tear mm. um, so so I think that this 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 novel is really all about people say it to them people say it to each other at various times obviously it takes place over 20 years so the kids the kids they grow up and they get older and stuff and, and half of the time when people say it they, they don't really mean it <laughs> and that's kind of the point so it's kind of meant and, and like you know they're not taking care of each other they're not taking care of each themselves and and it's often it's oftentimes said in farewell um so I just really wanted to play with that mm. so the whole the whole thing is really the title is so important <laughs> mm, mm. yeah because I, I know you, you you have a you have care you have care too right <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, yeah. So part of my current work is is thinking through, um, I, I guess mostly not caring or kind of not wanting to care or that kind of refusal of care. In part, I think is a resistance to kind of academia has become care work in quite troubling ways. I I think, um, and I think that. Um, yeah, take care was something that I started to say in emails. It was my sign off in emails at the beginning of the pandemic, and I got so perturbed by by repeating it so so often. Yeah. Um, but it it felt like the only thing that I could do to you know indicate you know I might not know you or I might not know you well, but I still wish you all the best without saying all best wishes, which <laughs> means absolutely nothing. <laughs> um, yeah, so this kind of like refusal refusal of care or yeah and I've just written a piece on Laurie Moore and the way in which she really embodies in her short stories particularly in um, self-help um, this kind of absolute refusal to actually take care of, of, of things or, or rather that the taking of care is 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 a violent kind of act it, it's a you know kind of capturing of, of, of care yeah. perhaps in ways that are, aren't reciprocal um so yeah I'm really interested in, in I that, that kind of idea. I love that as, as a premise of inquiry that's so fascinating and so, so you guys I'm just I'm just so pulling out from Lord Google sorry to be creepy minimal minimal care I love that I love the word minimal as well because it's it's there's something very there's something very hard-edged about it because it's it cannot it cannot help but have contemporary resonance right like minimal techno minimal care minimal <laughs> minimalism um, exactly. minimal decor you know it's so like um and and when you were talking about self-help which I love that I love that collection so much I think it's so funny but I was also something that came to mind about about characters in contemporary fiction that don't take care of themselves they don't take care of them really um Raven mm. Lalani's luster mm. you know she's she's so like that, that protagonist is so you know you worry for her she's, she can barely kind of you know feed herself and and yeah, actually, now that you, yeah, now that now that I think about it, there's a, there's a lot of that kind of coming up with with with, with heroines in particular in, in literature. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it. I, I think we really do see it a lot more um, in. Yeah, I don't want to say women's literature, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> literature written by women, uh, let's say, or or kind of. Um, novels or short stories that that center around women who who might be in caring roles or roles that we ostensibly think of as caring like nurses or in the medical profession or um or who have a dying loved one or who are caring for an ailing mother those kinds of roles and 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 that's where the resistance really comes up and i think you know certainly in a lot of the kind of um, d uh, discussion about the care crisis there's a lot of acknowledgement about the ambivalence of care right that it's it's not necessarily a, a wholeheartedly uh, positive um, action or kind of affect or or something but yeah this kind of question of how how little care can we give but yet still be kind of effective with that with that care um, 
is kind of the question that's yeah motivating me at the moment um so maybe i think this is a nice segue actually to the next question which is do you think being an academic on literature and creative writing as well as a writer influenced your writing process in any way oh um yeah i think so i think that um i used to be i used to be uh, um oh thanks thank you to anonymous attendee <laughs> I'm very kind of you thank you um but no i used to think that um there was almost a kind of superstitious um, fear of contamination that I had, particularly at the start of my PhD, where I was so worried that I would, I would kind of like take on so much kind of critical work and, and so much read too many books about craft that I, I would it kind of ruin my writing. Mm -hmm. But I, I've I've come to disregard that. I think that there are a lot of novelists that don't they don't have to do MAs or MFAs and they don't have to read any craft books and and they they kind of just find their own way. Um, but I think for, for, for the, then the other people like me who are really anxious and will just like read everything like that I can get my hands on to like hopefully be become better at stuff. So I do think that actually uh, my PhD was a bit like, you know, having like a really, really terrible fever, like a, you know, a kind of infectious, horrible fever, like, you know, and, and I just, I was like stricken with it. But now that, now that I've sweated it out and I, and I have it, I'm so glad I did it. Um, you know, I, I, I think it, it was really, it was really, really valuable um, to, to kind of have this sort of critical armature and to kind of like just read a little bit more intensively in a way that one might not necessarily, you know, we have such attention deficit these days, you know, it's, it's hard to even sit down and read the whole thing on one tab on your browser. So like, you know, having that concerted time and that kind of pressure to really read intensively and read around different, different fields of theory um it has been was really really valuable and I, I do think that it does help my work to an extent I, I i don't actually i no longer believe about like you know worrying if it's going to corrupt any sort of creative practice at this point i've reached a level of desperation where if i can get write anything down you know, i think i think i used to say with some friends that like, oh if only we could just write you know um, some kind of best-selling sort of like chick chiclet best-selling by the way <laughs> you know the next 50 shades of gray or whatever but now now i i, I kind of poo poo that kind of arrogance it's, it's kind of arrogance to assume that that's easy I think that that's hard. I think that writing is writing is hard and challenging. And it has its own challenges and rewards, like regardless of the form. And, and I, I'm just very, very grateful that that um, you know the teaching that that I used to kind of supplement my writing career is is, is you know in, in a field that I'm very passionate about. I love I love reading about writing. I love reading other writers, unless it's not 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 my cup of tea kind of thing. But you know I get to set the the reading list. So I love reading about writers. I love discussing writing. So it's. I think it really, it really does enrich. So the, the, the dream thing would be to keep keep being able to do this, but I, I need to finish this rewrite first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I mean, it's very, um, I mean, there's something about quite just like horrifying, like there's a body horror involved in, in, in writing a PhD, I think that you don't really know is <laughs> going is going to be the experience until you're actually in the in, in the kind of thick of it. Um, I was wondering what has the process of writing this second novel been yeah. like in comparison to writing your first one? I mean, um, you're rewriting at the moment. Is I mean, people often talk about the kind of the dreaded second novel um, or the dreaded second yeah. album. Um, deep in deep in that right now, I'm just kind of like I don't know if I will ever finish it. I I, I think like. Um, in the first iteration that I got to the end of it, I, I was kind of chiseling and working out the story for myself. Um, the rewrite is almost a complete rewrite, I think. Like, but in the first one, I tried to, to make it placeless and dateless because I just thought it was so radical. But like, <laughs> um, you know, like newsflash, it, it's very hard to read something that's placeless and dateless. So the only the only thing that was definite about about it was like that they were a Singaporean family, and you know the kind of material facts that I, I kind of let on that that it's about a little girl who goes you know disappears and then somehow comes back, right? Um, um, is found in some way um but but everything else around it was quite uncertain and now actually my my agent uh, read it and was like yeah it, was, it gets really confusing like you know, <laughs> over the time you have like you know you have six main characters over 20 years right and it gets really really like very confusing like you know when you <laughs> you know it's all, it's all in third person but essentially like they're all different ages right so imagine they're all different ages it's in third person like close to, to each one of them but every single chapter i'm not telling you where we 
telling you where they are and I'm not telling you what date it is. Can you imagine how confusing that is to read? Horrible, absolutely horrible. And I had this whole whole strand in there about aliens. <laughs> um, so it's whole strand, I'm not even kidding. Like I had this whole strand narrated by aliens, which I thought again was so zany <laughs> and, and so intelligent. But like, now I, I can't even read it, honestly. But I've taken out the aliens and I've put in um, places. Mm. So including some I haven't like been to. <laughs> mm, that's interesting yeah hopefully i'll figure it out i still have enough like i i, I have some faith in it i i think to, to, i i i say this like with caution i don't think i can keep in, um working on it forever but i would mm. very much like to be having this conversation with you where i've like like triumphantly like you know finished it and like you know sold that and like another novel and i'd be like so like you know the queen of productivity here with like coffee <laughs> You know, after this, Alexandra, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna do my, what I call my evening ritual. You know, that's like <laughs> my 800 words in the PM. You know, or something. Rather than instead, what I probably do after this is watch the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which is my current, <laughs> my current lockdown escapism. <laughs> uh, I love the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Good. It's a good choice. It's a good choice. Yeah. There's a lot of parallels in there with the creative process. It feels like her, her, her agent, who I, I quite like, who's like the lady from Family Guy, which is very strange. She tells her like, you know, part of being a stand-up comedian is bombing, right? And like, you know, being prepared to fail. And I think that anyone that's doing anything creative, whether you're working on a monograph or like uh, writing a piece of music, they, you know, that, that's true, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I, I, I find it good. It's also a good um, example of, characterization where where they they kind of make you care about the characters initially like uh, yeah we don't want to talk about this at all. yeah no no i mean you go on forever about this <laughs> well i was wondering um just as we kind of um draw perhaps draw to a close if you're in the audience and you haven't yet asked the question that you're dying to ask please put it <laughs> into the q a box so that we uh, don't finish close out the conversation without having a chance to um, uh, address it. Um, I wondered, I mean, I suppose, uh, one question I had, uh, I suppose it came out of your answer uh, just then, was this, um, um, yeah, the relationship between teaching, teaching and writing. Um, and I wondered whether you enjoy teaching I, I do. I, I mean, I think I do to an extent. I, I love it on my current schedule where I'm not doing it all the time. I'm doing it half the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I love that. And I think that um, particularly when it comes to, um, you know, dealing with students like um, work and progress and stuff like that. Um, a lot of the time when it comes to, you know, thesis uh, kind of advisory meetings, it kind of is more like therapy. I feel like I've, I've kind of become a sort of like, like creative therapist rather than you know you, you know I feel like my role is to, to tell the writer like you know it's okay you have permission to do that you have permission to like try that and not you know give yourself permission to try that and you know if it doesn't work out it's fine you know I'll just give you a snippy document with track changes where I'm just like why this or why that mm -hmm. uh, I really really enjoy it I really enjoy um, reading different writers work and seeing how uh, I think Sheila Hetty was saying this in that talk of hers I just was watching. She says that really like um, writing, uh, fiction in particular, is nothing more than a kind of expression of um, a kind of like, you know, a, a, the expression of like what the writer is trying to convey at, of based around their, aggregated around the experiences of who they are at one particular point of time. That's mm -hmm. not to say that everything is autobiographical, hardly that, but, but it's more that, um, I think writing when it's done well is 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 an ex a form of kind of narrative expression that can only be true to you. And I think that when writing fails or when it seems to be weak is when when it kind of cues away from that. You know, it goes more toward a sort of disingenuity where, where you know someone trying to sound like something they're not, right? Mm. Or, or kind of, I think that the kind of if, if it could be a technical create sentence to sentence of poor writing, it's it's kind of skewing toward the general, right? Mm. skewing toward abstraction because 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 narrative the narrative form is really all about entering into the dream state um of, of consciousness so that's why I, I guess something like the internet novel um which is a bit like one of that wolfgang tillman's exhibition on moving through the internet that that you know that the kind of ability of certain writers to simulate that experience is mm. is really really commendable it's not it's not particularly my aesthetic 
um, um, interest. I, I, I'm not interested in writing an internet novel. I'm interested in um, writing about characters that, that, that have lived with you know, the analog and, and the digital and how that might in some senses affect their ability to memorialize and, and their ability to kind of make sense of, of who they are and the kind of relics of who they are. Uh, similarly, Ponty, you know, like with, with this woman who has these cultural artifacts, I think right now, people our age and millennials, whatever, we have the, we have the kind of physical and digital re relics of who we were and who we want to be with, with aspiration. So I'm interested mm -hmm. in that, but I'm not necessarily interested in, in, in adding to the canon of the internet novel. I, I wouldn't presume to be able to, to, to do that. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I, I often, um, uh, in some of my undergraduate classes, particularly when I'm teaching on, um, on the contemporary novel, but the contemporary novel, like the sort of elderly contemporary novel, perhaps, <laughs> um, and, and the kind of the dial-up tone of internet, um, which, you know, <laughs> undergraduate students today just don't know what that sounds like. So there's kind of no kind of cultural reference point for it. Um, and it seems so strange to me that that's already kind of you know, uh, disappearing so quickly into the past. Um, like they don't know, like um, I think I saw a meme where apparently like some people don't know that, you know, when you, the save icon in Microsoft Word, that's like a floppy disk, right? And yes. we to that from our childhood. Right? <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of wild. Um, yeah. It's wild, it's totally wild. So we've got another, um, another question, um, yeah. in, which we might take as our final question. Um, Hi, thank you so much for all the insights so far. It's been wonderful. I was just wondering if when you write about Singapore in your novels, do you write about the place nostalgically? Since you mentioned early on that you haven't lived there continuously since 2005. Yeah, um, completely. And, and by the way, this has been an incredible audience, like really in terms of the questions and engagement and stuff. Um, so thank you all of you for, for um, listening to us instead of the, the Euros or, or whatever. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I do write about Singapore entirely nostalgically, and and I think that, frankly, um, I, I feel I was I was supposed to be home. Actually, I was supposed to go scheduled to go home next week. Um, also, would have been partly a teaching based thing, so I, I was going to be home for you know two months, and I was really looking forward because I haven't been home since twenty nineteen, um, and it's almost like I. I I have nothing to draw from. And I think that it, 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 it kind of becomes a well where if you just keep drawing from nostalgia, it, it's like anything else, you know, it, it kind of risks feeling not exploitative, but it, it risks feeling like an anecdote that, that, is, that was charming once, but when you rehash it too many times, it's, it's, devoid. it's, of, it's devoid of the kind of inflection and sincerity that, that made it mean anything in the first place. So I, I need to go back to Singapore and spend some time there to write about it with any kind of nuance, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, there's another question that's I yes. think, interesting. One. How, how difficult is it to write about a culture your audience might not be familiar with? Another great question. <laughs> um, I think that I, I don't think of myself as a kind of cultural representative or a native informant. If anything, I think that I um more like a kind of spy that doesn't belong in any territory <laughs> like I, I i don't belong of the uk i don't belong of singapore i think that my my true kind of cultural identity is like kind of like hovering somewhere in the sea you know somewhere in the flight path on the way to new zealand actually yeah you see me, you see me like you know hovering somewhere where all the, the underground cables are with the internet you know near near some whales that are chilling out that, that's really where i feel i belong so i i I feel that's why I tried to write a whole strand of aliens in, in the previous iteration of this draft because I not not to say that I feel as alien as an alien, but I feel that I'm not necessarily writing to to explain um, Singaporean culture, but what I am trying to do is I'm trying to narrativize um, what it is to to be a being that that is Singaporean in this world, and I hope that I think that the form follows the kind of affective intent. And, and the kind of I don't want to say function because it sounds too functional. The affective intent, the kind of the kind of motion of emotion. So I think that if one thing moves, the other will follow. So I think I think I, I, I'm really really concerned with with trying to write about characters that I deeply care about and that mm -hmm. I want the readers to really care about, mm -hmm. and and everything else around that, um, the kind of cultural particularities of their experience. I hope that that doesn't get in the way of 
the text and that but that that kind of that comes through as well right mm -hmm. oh. mm. <laughs> Well, I mean, it did for me. Um, I read Ponzi before I'd been to Singapore, and it really, it, I think, um, you know, it can sometimes be quite, um, yeah, that kind of idea of like cultural representation can be so reductive um, for a text that is doing so many different kinds of things, right? And is, and is so interested in so many different kinds of things. Oh, um, questions coming in thick and fast now. Um, Ooh, oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> This is a great question. Um, in reading about Ponti, I was really interested in Circe's choice um, of name like the Greek myth and the discussion of Sue's mother as a famous actress from, from, a, from horror, horror film genre and a character from mythology also, I believe. Yeah, the Pontiana. Um, thinking about how you discuss toying with the idea of writing a placeless novel or a timeless novel before settling on adding more place markers. Do you feel adding these references to the horror film genre and mythology from different cultures actually help to make the novel feel universally relevant? Sounds amazing. I've ordered my copy. Thank you. Thank you. All these, all these anonymous, anonymous attendee, all of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's such a really considered and incisive um, comment. I think that yeah, I think that um, I'm not necessarily looking for that like, uni universal relevance, but I'm, I'm I, I, in the in the kind of sense of like, oh, I want to hit as many markers as possible. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm kind of interested in, um, um, in 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 the kind of patterns of stories. So like, you know, the, the the kind of the kind of resonances across culture that that there there's a trope of a sexy young woman, or there's there's a trope of a siren, and and it was with with reference to the kind of Pontiana myth. Of a young woman walking alone at night, I, I kind of am interested in the social, the social undertones of that, like what that kind of says of particular social cultural fears at the time, and how how these fears and myths change and evolve, and they're they are shaped by our own our own idea of myth making, and and the idea that um, I think it was a Hilary Mantel quote actually, where she was saying that history. You know, we 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 kind of we kind of have in, in just the kind of like the bones and the kind of marrow of our ancestors. It sounds a lot more grisly than what she was actually saying. But we we also like our, our attitudes to them, our, our our attitudes towards them reflect our attitudes towards us ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we look to the past really to kind of interpret our presence, right? And that's that's constantly why we look to stories and there's a kind of constant allure, timeless allure of stories. Um and I, I think that that's something that never gets old. That kind of that kind of dominating belief that 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 there's a constellation of systems and stories with heroes and antagonists and and you know rise and fall from Aristotle till now till normal people let's say you know where where we are we are concerned with that human project of of, of memorializing and making sense of of our feelings and 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 our ways of moving through the world through the shape of stories. Mm. Um, and I, I think myths never get old. Mm. Um, but I, I have to kind of admit, so in, in terms of Circe's naming, I just like the name Circe, but then I've actually done a bunch of attempts to do with Greek mythology where I kind of made it seem a lot more like, oh yeah, it was that Circe. <laughs> I'm just telling you now because it's like, you know, three years after it's come out, so it's fine, I can do that now. <laughs> but at the time I was like, oh yeah, of course, of course, you know, a lot of hers, you know, an interpretation of, you know, the figure from the, the Odyssey. You know, I love the Odyssey, I do, but uh, no, it's like the name. <laughs> yeah. It is a great name. Oh, thank you so much, Martha. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was um, I was thinking about um the um, uh, gosh, it's just gone from my mind. Um, and so it's the kind of the, yeah, the monstrousness of women, um, which sort of ties into what we were talking about before in terms of in terms of care and carelessness and the kind of monstrosity of mothers towards daughters and how uncaring that is but sometimes it does come from a place of, of care um and i mean obviously monstrousness or the monstrousness of mothers has become a, a really popular kind of thing to uh sort of feature in a contemporary novel right there's you know um i mean sheila hezzy wrote her book um on motherhood pardon burnt sugar by Afni doshi yes exactly yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah that's right and and this kind of critique of mothers being uh, being careless or 
uncaring or cruel or monstrous um but it's such fantastic creative and psychological um kind of fruit to play with right in in, in a text mm -hmm. um yeah um okay so i think that might be the final question so we're gonna move towards the end now so thank you so much Eileen, for coming to um uh, yeah, for taking part in this conversation and this event, uh, for being so generous with your current work. I mean, I think it's a real treat that we were able to hear um, some work in progress, which is um, which is unusual for these kinds of events. So it's, it's really wonderful. Um, and I'm sure everybody in the audience is really, really looking forward to seeing, seeing that um, novel on bookshelves and uh, being able to, to buy it and read it and read some more. Um, so I hope you all uh, can join me in your homes to thank uh, Charlene. Um, obviously one of the pleasures of being able to chat to a writer like Charlene is that we can get inside the head of, of, of the writers that we really love, the, the books that we really love. Um, and it helps us as readers, of course, to come closer to that creative process and to think about, or to see how an obsession can develop um, and here develop over multiple books as well not to only look at um, a novel as final form on the page as a static um, you know lifeless thing but to think of it as as a living breathing thing which I think is you know I mean it's a really aspirational way of thinking about literature but I've really felt it here tonight so um, thank you so much Charlene uh, it's been a real pleasure to chat um, and um, so I've just got some final final notes just to close out close out the um, close out the conversation. So of course the the recording of this event will be available on the festival YouTube channel, which can be accessed from the Watch Again section of the festival website after the twentieth of June. Um, and you'll be contacted by email when the video uh, is available to view. Um, but I also imagine it's, it will be Googleable Google um, after that point. If you would like to purchase a copy of Shelling Supple Ponty, um, it is available from our partner bookseller Fox Lane Books, who's a wonderful independent uh, bookseller in York. Um, and for more information on book sales, you can see the festival website. Um, and or head directly to foxlanebooks.co.uk. Um, we very much hope that you will continue to be engaged with the uh, York Festival of, of Ideas. Um, if you're interested in seeing more events or seeing what's coming up, you can check out the website yorkfestivalofideas.com for full detail of all the events in the festival program. And we would love to hear your thoughts on these events and continue conversations using the hashtag uh, hashtag York ideas uh, if you are on social media. So thank you so much Charlene and thank you to all of you um, for tuning in. Uh, we hope that you have a lovely evening. <laughs>